When I step into this game room, what systems do I end up having the most fun with? The answer might surprise you. Join me as I share with you my top 10 favorite game systems to play today. To illustrate my points, I'm going to be showing real game footage from over 125 games. Before we begin, a little bit of background on who I am and what I have going on with these shelves. I've been playing video games since the early 1980s. In the past 10 years or so, I've purchased and played every major American game system. This game room is designed to have those systems available to play at any time, and I have a sizable collection of titles to choose from. How much is all this worth? See the video link in the description. What are these trays underneath each console? See the video link in the description. During my lifetime, I've accumulated a lot of warm, fuzzy memories of these systems, but today I'm going to only concentrate on the recent memories, like in the past five years or so. Why do that? Because some of you may want to play some retro systems, so it's good to know which ones have held up over time, according to me. My only measure is going to be enjoyment. I'm not going to consider the historical value or monetary value of each system. Even though I have all the major systems, I haven't played them all equally, so some systems won't make the list simply because I haven't played them enough. That will change over time as I play more games. At the end of this video, I'm going to go over some systems that I expect to rise on this list over time. Tell me in the comments whether you agree or disagree with the list, or tell me what systems you like to play today. I'm curious to see what ones we have in common. So let's jump into it, starting with number 10. Number 10 is the Sega Saturn. The Saturn beat out some tough competition to get into the 10th spot. Graphically, Saturn games are similar to the PS1, but in terms of style, there is something more about them that separates them from the PS1. If I can deduce that style into one word, it would be magical. There's something magical about riding the back of a dragon in Panzer Dragoon, or flying through the skies in Nights into Dreams. Yes, the graphics can look blocky at times, and they could be remastered to look better, but I believe you would lose some of the magic in the process. The one Saturn game I've played the most is Iron Storm. It's a turn-based World War II strategy game where you play as one of the major military powers. Another game worth mentioning is Mr. Bones. It's not the best game, but there's no other game like it. If you're a regular visitor to this channel, you know I love shoot 'em ups, and the Saturn has plenty of high quality ones. First, I should mention that the Saturn did not sell well in America, but it did well in Japan. There were some good shoot 'em ups that got released in America, like Galactic Attack and Darius Gaiden. But if you have a way to play Japanese games on the American unit, like with this memory cartridge that I use, there is a whole slew of other shoot 'em ups to sample. One drawback to the Saturn is that if you play enough of the games for it, you'll eventually reach the end of the good games, and from there there is a large drop-off. The first party games are what I stick to mainly. Nonetheless, some Saturn games have aged like fine wine. I'm very happy to own the system and many of the key games for it. Let's move on to number 9. Number 9 is the PS2. I was late to the party on this one. When it was in production, I played very little of it, but when the PS3 and PS4 carried the torch onward, I went and grabbed up a bunch of PS2 games for cheap. I then crept slowly into its library, playing God of War and God of War 2, Twisted Metal Black, and Jack and Daxter. All four of those games I ended up playing all the way to the end.
I've still played more Saturn than PS2, but I believe the PS2 is a notch above, simply because its selection of games is so robust. All the genres are there, from first-person shooters, to shoot-em-ups, to RPGs. The system had the benefit of being in production a very long time, selling millions upon millions of units, which is why the selection of games is so fleshed out. There's enough games for it to last the rest of my life. The one thing that keeps it from being higher on the list is that some of its games are not easy to dive into on a moment's notice. There are many unskippable cutscenes, forced tutorials, and pop-up explanatory text boxes. Another thing about PS2 games is that they are dark visually, which is both good and bad. If you do an internet search on dark PS2 graphics, you'll see a lot of old threads from people asking why their screen is so dark when they play the PS2. Most of them are blaming their TVs or the method in which their system is hooked up. It's funny to read. But the games are pretty much designed with darkness in mind, probably to hide flaws in the robust 3D graphics. Correct me if I'm wrong. Regardless, some developers embraced the dark aesthetics. Twisted Metal Black has it built into the name of the game. Despite giving the games a depressing feel, I grew accustomed to the darker tones. It gives the system its own look and feel. In the end, the PS2 has brought me a lot of great experiences and will continue to do so into the future. Let's see what number 8 is. Number 8 is the Atari 2600. Have I gone crazy? A console from the late 70s is more fun than the PS2? I got my work cut out for me on this one. Let me explain it in one sentence. The Atari 2600 has games that are easy to jump into, are quick to play, and have timeless game mechanics. Let me go deeper. The world of the Atari 2600 is different than the worlds of other consoles. It's a place that is dark and alien, yet beautiful at the same time. Playing a 2600 game is the equivalent to taking a 1960s car out for a ride. Yes, it doesn't have all the latest features, but the sights and sounds are unique. It's a feel that cannot be replicated with modern technology. The ability to make games like this have been lost to the sands of time. The following games are still fun to play today. Yars Revenge, Berserk, Kaboom, Missile Command, Demon Attack, Asteroids, Pitfall and Pitfall 2, Frogger, River Raid, Turmoil, Centipede, Millipede, Junior Pac-Man, Ms. Pac-Man, Enduro, and Mega Mania. Every once in a while, I'll grab a stack of games like those and spend an evening playing them. I have a good time doing so. I could play them without wading through tutorials or wading through logo screens and title screens. My eyes don't get tired from playing these games because the graphics are simplistic. That's a good benefit if you work a full-time job like me that is demanding on your eyes. The titles I enjoy the most are the ones where you're a ship at the bottom of the screen shooting upward. They are basically shoot-em-ups, and there's a ton of them. Did I mention I love shoot-em-ups? Demon Attack is one I keep coming back to. Like many other 2600 games, the stages get harder and harder, till eventually your game is over. The enemies look slightly different with each wave. I've never seen what the enemies look like in later waves, because I can't get that far. It makes me want to keep on trying. Getting a high score is a big motivator too for a lot of these games. Another thing that the Atari 2600 games excel at is game variations. By clicking this switch, you can toggle through different ways of playing the same game. Like in Space Invaders, you can select variations that include invisible invaders, moving shields, and zigzagging lasers. It has 112 different ways to play in all. Yes, there are a lot of bad games for the system. Some became bad over time, but many were bad the moment they came out. Now let me tell you a secret, I want you to get really close to the speaker. I'm gonna whisper this, despite what you might have heard on the internet. The E.T. game isn't that bad. Once you learn what the different symbols at the top of the screen do, you'll realize that this game is a randomized scavenger hunt. 
It is certainly not the worst game on the console, not by a long shot. Until the true word gets out, we'll just keep pretending this is the worst game ever. Okay, so the biggest and most obvious drawback to these games is that they're freaking old. The graphics have been outdated for decades. To get over the fact, I just have to get myself in the right mood. Being a little slap happy helps. Another drawback is that the game reset trigger is on the console. It's how you start most games. You also need it to restart after the game is over. You obviously have to be close to the unit. It's a pain to do in my current setup, but I'm working on a solution. The joysticks are a pain in the butt too, but that can be remedied easily by using a controller from another system. A Sega Genesis control pad works great. All in all, the 2600 is a wonderful system to have. I'll be playing it off and on until the system breaks. Then I'll just get another one. Time for number seven. Number 7 is the Sega Dreamcast. Even though this machine's time in the sun wasn't that long, it gave birth to many unforgettable games. Shinmu is unforgettable. Seaman is unforgettable. Toy Commander is unforgettable. Jet Grind Radio is unforgettable. Crazy Taxi is unforgettable. Choo Choo Rocket is unforgettable. The list goes on. It's the hardest system to put into words, and it's best explained by playing it yourself. There's really no other way to put it. What about drawbacks? Well, the number of games available is less than the number of games for other systems on this list. Also, the controller's analog stick is overly sensitive. It's not very analog at all. It goes from like 50% to 100% very easily. I notice it every time I play. Even with those grievances, the Dreamcast puts a smile on my face whenever I play it. Let's head for number 6. The Game Boy Advance is a portable beast. I have two of them, and one of them is always sitting around my living room somewhere. I also take one with me when I go on vacation. It provides an endless amount of entertainment, and also most of the games have numerous save points, allowing you to play them in small stretches of time, perfect for playing on the go. The selection of games is massive, and full of what I like to call small joys. There's three excellent Castlevania games, all of them I finished 100% a long time ago and I'm currently going through them again. If you like Symphony of the Night for the PS1, you'll like those games as well. I've also recently played through the two Advance Wars games, which are excellent turn-based strategy games, best played from the comfort of the sofa. The system was one of the last to have a ton of side-scrolling 2D platformers. There's even some decent RPGs to be found. Many of the titles are exclusive to the system, it's also home to a large population of hidden gems, like Racing Gears Advance, which made my top 10 hidden gems of retro gaming list. See the link in the description. The big drawback to the Game Boy Advance is that it got hit with a wave of shovelware during the height of its popularity. Just about every licensed product intended for kids got a release. Nonetheless, with close to 1,000 games for the system, there is no limit to the entertainment value that this little device can provide. We're halfway done with the list. Now we're getting into the big players. Number 5 is on the way.
Number five is the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. What drives me to play the Super NES is the great gameplay. I think I've beaten Super Metroid about five times since it was released. Each time I 100% completed it. Something I enjoy doing in certain games, in case you haven't noticed. Smash TV is another game I've been playing off and on for decades. It's like the old arcade game, Robotron. Two people can play at the same time, and it controls perfectly on the four button controller. Me and my wife have played a lot of the two-player Bomberman games. I went out of my way to buy the third, fourth, and fifth installments which never came out in America. The games I usually import are shoot-'em-ups, so it just goes to show how much I like the series. Much like the Game Boy Advance, the selection of side-scrolling platformers is immense. There's some good shoot-'em-ups here and there, too. The games on the Super NES have some of the best music of all the systems on this list. I frequently use it as background music on this channel. It's not a coincidence that the system is right beside the Game Boy Advance on this list. The games are very similar in the graphics department, which is a good thing. They were not afraid to use bright, vibrant colors when they made these games. All in all, the Super NES shall forever be part of my gaming regimen. It's too good to ever stop playing. Number 4 is directly ahead. Number 4 is the PS1. Some might say the system is part of the first generation of 3D gaming, and henceforth is now outdated. Yes, a lot of the graphics have not aged well, especially the cutscenes, but there's more going on with this system than meets the eye. I'm all about finding hidden gems, and the PS1 by far has the most hidden gems of any system on this list. You'll see some of them in this footage. The reason why there are so many under-the-radar games is probably because the rate in which companies were cranking them out while the system was in production. It was hard for the gaming press to keep up with them all. The PS1 was selling well and a lot of developers were on board. I also was reading in an old gaming magazine where Sony mentioned they were cranking out a lot of their own games to counter the launch of the N64. Besides the hidden gems, there's a large number of well-known classic games for the system. Ones that are still fun to play today. Symphony of the Night is basically Sony's Super Metroid, and I've played through it multiple times. Like the PS2, the success of the PS1 means that the library is very fleshed out, with games of every genre. Now, the games do have a jagged look to them, but I don't mind. Many of the games take place in a mechanized dystopian future, and for some reason, that combines well with the jagged look. Go play LAPD Future Cop if you want to see what I mean. Although my collecting has died down, I still find myself ordering a lot of PS1 games. The trail of good and unknown games never seems to end. Nobody mess with my PS1. Let's reveal number 3. Of all the systems on this list, the PS4 is the one I own the least number of games for. But what I have played has been so compelling, I could literally play it for 3 hours straight and never get tired of it. Years ago, I was not into modern games that much. But since a new generation of systems launched during the heart of my collecting phase, I felt obligated to purchase them. When I bought the PS4 at launch, I picked up Killzone Shadowfall. There wasn't much else available at the time, I just kind of randomly picked it. 
I had no prior history with the Killzone series, it ended up being a beautiful game. But the single player campaign was a bit boring for me. Once I beat the single player, I decided to give the multiplayer a try. Before then, the last time I played online multiplayer was Quake 3 on the Dreamcast, some 14 years prior. As it turns out, Killzone's online multiplayer is awesome. I ended up joining the Killzone community, so to speak, and met a lot of people. Later on, I bought Rainbow Six Siege, another excellent online multiplayer game. It turned out to be one of the best games I've played this generation. I don't know if I got lucky with these two games, but both made a huge impression on me, and I became a big fan of online multiplayer. I'm currently playing Titanfall 2 online, and once again, I'm very much into it. These games are wonderful as long as the servers stay up, and luckily they are still up for the three games I've mentioned so far. I've played some non-first person shooters as well. Detroit Become Human was a wonderful game. I ended up playing through it with my wife. It has the best storyline and characters of any game I've ever played. The cherry on top of it all is the VR headset. The games I've been playing inside of it have transformed the way I think about gaming. Needless to say, the PS4 has made an impression on me. We're almost to the top of the mountain. The next two are the king and queen of my game room. Number two is the Nintendo Entertainment System. The Nintendo Entertainment System may be more than three decades old, but it hasn't aged a bit to me. The 8-bit graphics are still appealing to the eyes, the music is still appealing to the ears, and the gameplay will always be appealing to the brain. In fact, when capturing this footage, I didn't want to stop playing these games. The 2D platformers are amazing. The Marios, the Mega Man, DuckTales, the Castlevanias. There's even some good shoot 'em ups like Gradius, 1943, and Life Force. Pretty much anything that Konami or Capcom made is awesome. Contra, Jackal, Bionic Commando, Ghost and Goblins. There's some other companies that made gems like Ninja Gaiden and Blaster Master. I consider many of these games works of art. Most of the games are the pick up and play variety. You never have to relearn how to play Super Mario Bros. Yes, there are a lot of crappy games too, but with all the ones I just mentioned, there's enough goodness on the system to have it be the only system in my house. I wish the cartridges would work better though. Sometimes it takes me three times to get them to work. Regardless, the NES is an essential system to me, and it just barely missed being number one. And here comes number one. I've played more Sega Genesis than any other console, and I'm likely to keep playing it as long as I still have one. Something that's very likely since I have many spare ones stored away. The selection of games for it is a nice balance between quick pick up and play arcade style games and games that are more involved. Regardless of the type of game, they all seem to have one large cohesive personality to them, if that makes sense. Although I like the NES almost as equally as the Genesis, the Genesis has a leg up because the games are just more polished. 
A good way to think about it is to compare Ghosts and Goblins on the NES compared to Ghouls and Ghosts on the Genesis. I like both games for different reasons, but I get more out of the Ghouls and Ghosts experience. It's not just about the graphics, there's just more overall depth to everything. More weapons, more enemies, and so forth. Compared to other systems, the Genesis games are fast-paced and run smoothly. If you want an example of that, play Sonic the Hedgehog. That fast-paced and run smoothly aspect lends itself well to the shoot 'em ups The Genesis has a ton of them, and in my opinion as a whole, the Genesis is home to the best ones. As far as other genres, the Genesis clicks about every box. I've enjoyed many RPGs like Fantasy Star, platformers like Revenge of Shinobi, strategy games like Warsong, and best of all, the beat-em-ups like Streets of Rage. The games just complete me, for lack of a better term. The Genesis is the king of my game room, and will probably be so for a long time. I mentioned earlier I was going to talk about which systems I expect to rise on my list over time. I expect that to happen with the PS2. I haven't spent as much time with it as I should, but there's a lot of games for it in my backlog. And I know many of those games are going to be memorable. The original Xbox is another for pretty much the same reasons for the PS2. I haven't played it a lot, and there's a lot of games I'm going to play for it in the future. In the portables department, I expect the PSP to rise. Its library is deep, and I see many games for it that are the kind that I would find enjoyable from the couch. Potentially, the PS4 could move up to number one. Of course, when the servers are taken down on my favorite games, I won't be able to play them anymore, so maybe the PS4 will fall. So that's all I had today. Thank you for making it to the end. Feel free in the comments to share what systems you enjoy playing the most today. See you later.